Hello and welcome to episode 98 of This Week in Germany. We'll be bringing the world to Germany and Germany to the world with news for the week beginning the 16th of November 2015. I'm Daniel. And I'm Rob. Each week we feature stories from the news, society and culture in the English language. If you want to find out more, including ways to follow us on Facebook and Twitter, head over to our website, thisweekingermany.de. Saturday afternoon outside the French embassy in Berlin. This is Parisia Platz, or Paris Square. The day after the attacks in the French capital, thousands are gathering here to pay their respects to the dead. In the heart of Berlin's political and diplomatic district at Brandenburg Gate, flags are flying at half-mast. People of all nationalities are laying candles, flowers and messages written on cards. There's a solemn air of respect and sadness. It's less than a year since Berliners did the same. That was after the shooting at a French satirical magazine, Charlie Hebdo, and on a Jewish supermarket. A total of 17 died then. The death toll in this latest attack stands at well over 100. In January and February of this year, rallies of support from all segments of society convened in Berlin. The response to this latest attack is likely to be even stronger. And back in the studio now, we'll get more on the German reaction on those attacks in Paris in just a few minutes' time. But first, joining me on the line now is Helena Humphrey, who lives now in Berlin, but used to live in the 11th arrondissement where the attacks took place. So, Helena, thanks for joining us here on This Week in Germany. First of all, can you start off by telling us what happened on Friday evening? I think the drama really started unfolding at around 9.30 p.m. Paris time on Friday night when there was a series of explosions that were heard near the Stade de France. That's um, France's national stadium to the north of Paris in a suburb called Saint-Denis. And that was where French President François Hollande was watching France play Germany at an international football friendly. And then around one hour later, there were reports of a shooting at the Petit Cambodge restaurant, which is about um, just over 10 kilometers away from the Stade de France. And then there were more reports of shootings um, in front of terraces, which are in front of restaurants, um, also in the 10th and 11th districts of Paris. The drama then escalated further and there were reports that there were shootings with inside the Bataclan Music Hall, which is only a few hundred metres down the road from those terraces in Paris. And then we learned that there was an ongoing hostage situation within the concert hall, um, which then saw many, many more deaths. And so you used to live in one of the arrondissements where several of the attacks took place in the 11th. What would that area have been like on a Friday evening? It would have been absolutely packed. If you can imagine that um, the 10th and the 11th districts of Paris are actually some of the most urbanly dense, not just in Paris, but in the whole of Europe themselves. So a lot of people live there, but it's really the place that um, the French go to enjoy their Friday night, to sit with friends, family, enjoy a meal, um, something to drink. Uh, the, the French love their terraces and they stay outside on them as long as they can throughout the autumn. And it was a warm November night. So a lot of people would have even been sitting outside the restaurants and, and the cafes, just people watching. And I and I did hear from some friends um, who were in Paris that when authorities came past telling people to to move, uh, to get out of the way, um, to leave the cafe immediately. Some people said, well, why should we? Um, and I think that just shows the defiance of the French. They didn't necessarily understand what was happening at first and what was in- unfolding. And uh, the French aren't people who are easily scared. They are defiant. And then when they understood really what was happening, of course, a lot of people did move away from those areas. But they're incredibly um, colourful and uh, lively arrondissement in Paris, um, multi-ethnic, multi-ethnic communities that have enjoyed a lot of peace, um, a lot of great examples of neighbourhood spirit. And this would really come as a shock for for many of the French who live there alongside people who were uh, citizens of former French colonies, such as Algeria, for example. Um, It's just really shocking for these areas. How did the French authorities react immediately after the attack? From what I understand, there was an immediate deployment of uh, all police onto the streets. I know that subsequently all police leave 
has been um, cancelled for the time being in France, as well as the deployment of the army to the streets as well. And then we did see those uh, SWAT teams, as we'd say in English, then move into uh, the Bataclan theatre area as well. So very quickly, Paris was um, covered in an, a presence of authorities, as one would expect, and the city was on lockdown. Very shortly after we started to learn of events inside the Bataclan Music Hall, French President François Hollande immediately made a statement outside in the area supported by members of his cabinet and a state of emergency was declared. Now, I think to put that in perspective, it's important to understand that France has really only uh, ever declared approximately four states of national emergency. The last time was in 2005 under French President Jacques Chirac due to the riots in the suburbs of Paris. Now, a state of emergency in France is something that lasts uh, up to 12 days and then it needs to be voted on again for a new law to be passed to draw it out any longer. And the reason for that is that under a state of emergency, citizens can be deprived of their civil liberties. For example, people can be detained without trial, which um, is perhaps what you may expect when we really see an act of war. And that was what Francois Hollande uh, actually declared these attacks. All right. Helena Humphrey, thank you very much for joining us on This Week in Germany. Now, Rob, it's over to you. We'll hear more about the German reaction to the attacks in just a moment. But first, let's hear what Chancellor Angela Merkel has to say. Meine Damen und Herren, hinter uns liegt eine der schrecklichsten Nächte. Behind us lies one of the most terrible nights that Europe has experienced in a long time. People in Paris had to overcome a nightmare of violence, terror, and fear. And above all else, I would like to say to you and all the people of France today that we, your German friends, feel close to you. We cry with you. Together, we will help lead a fight against those who have carried out such horrible acts. This attack on freedom was not only an attack on Paris, but on us all. It struck us all, and we are going to answer in unison. Und er trifft uns alle. Und deswegen werden wir auch alle gemeinsam die Antwort geben. I'd like to turn now to Janelle Dumas-Laon, who's covering the German aspect for us. So, Janelle, you've also been to the French embassy. How would you describe the mood there? After all, it's less than a year since they were standing in solidarity with France after the last terrorist attack in January. Yes, Daniel. So I was actually there again today. So for a second day in a row, uh, people gathered in front of the French embassy on Prizer Platz or Paris Square. So as we know, that's right by the iconic Brandenburg Gate, which is still lit up in the French colors. Today, as, as yesterday, there was quite a big turnout, this time only with a sea of umbrellas floating, floating above a makeshift memorial. It's been raining hard all day, but despite the rain, the memorial is still growing. There are candles, there are cards in every conceivable language. The mood is still pretty somber, but you really do get the impression that it's important to Berliners to be able to show their solidarity and show their standing by the victims and their families in Paris. I had the feeling standing there on the square that the need to talk about this attack seems to be strong among Germans. The question on a lot of people's minds is whether that can happen here. And so that's the, the reaction of, of Germans in, in general. But what about politicians? What about the media? How have they reacted? Well, in the morning after the attacks, for example, we saw an uncharacteristically emotional um, Chancellor Merkel we, we know that she's not a leader given to great displays of feeling, but this time around she talked about shared pain and tears and, and of course, solidarity. One of the main focal points of, remar of her remarks, and I thought this was really interesting, has been that this was an attack perpetrated by people who hate freedom or the free way of life that exists here in Western Europe. And I also saw this theme taken up in various German media as well. Now, when Merkel was talking, she was, of course, highlighting the importance of protecting this way of life and not allowing terror and hate to poison society. But I also think she focused on freedom, also in anticipation of the associations that would be drawn between increased security risk and the open arms refugee policy that she's been pursuing. But she didn't quite say it like that. But I thought that implicit in her message defending freedom is the thought that freedom should be for everybody, including 
those who come here seeking to be free from war and persecution, like, like the refugees that are arriving in the thousands. Obviously, politicians unhappy with the refugee policy were indeed quick to point out that the Paris attacks are a reason to tighten the borders. Bavaria's premier, Horst Seehofer, has said that Germany needs tighter border controls and it's important for Germany to truly know who is coming into the country and that the Paris attacks are just a further example of that. Interior Minister Tomas de Mazira has also said that the country could, that the country Germany could, could also be targeted, that security forces are on high alert, um, and especially security at train stations and airports. They're all carrying um, visibly heavier weapons as a sort of deterrent. He also said that there were other uh, there were other security measures in place that he wasn't going to disclose for for tactical reasons. The overarching emotion is solidarity, is standing by the French people in this truly trying time. But behind that is a debate on whether we could truly protect ourselves and if so, how. Janelle dumas on freelance journalist in Berlin. Thank you very much for talking to me here on This Week in Germany. And now for this week's News in Brief. After the First and Second World Wars, Germany's military ceased to be. It was made official in August of 1946 that Germany had no military. That is, until 1955, when it was legally founded once again. So for nine years, Germany had no standing army or no other military practices. Now, it's been back for 60 years as of November 12th. This day in 1955 may have had another significance as well as why it was chosen to give Germany back its military on this day. It was the 200th birthday of the Prussian military general Gerhard von Scharnhorst. And now, six years later, Minister of Defense Ursula von der Leyen gave a speech during this event, where she urges German and European unity with the country's soldiers working to help out with the refugee crisis. The military also had a special parade outside the Bundestag, which was attended by over 2,000 guests. This included President Joachim Gauck and the Parliament President, Norbert Lammert. Lammert gave an inspiring speech about how far the Bundeswehr has come in the past 60 years. Many protesters also rallied nearby, mainly demonstrating against the German military going outside of Germany. And inside the Bundestag, the German Parliament has now passed the second part of the country's care reform bill. This is the biggest care reform that has been made in 20 years. This bill was and is about nursing care and is aimed at those who are cared for at home by attendees or family members. It has put provisions for doing more for these people who need help looking after themselves, and they want to give this care to them earlier and better than before. Now, the second part of the bill has passed, after the first part of the care bill went into effect earlier this year. Together, they increased the budget for care by about 5 billion euros. Though the care reform bill has already passed with a coalition majority, much criticism is still being made by the opposition that it was not the correct decision. Both the left party and the Greens think that while $5 billion is a good start, it still does not go far enough to provide the help the people need. Carnival has started in Germany. Each November, which is the 11th month, and then on the 11th day, at the 11th hour, on the 11th minute. Cheers are heard and much celebrating is done as Germany's carnival has begun. Thousands and thousands of people from across Germany go to some of the larger cities to attend the festivities. Cologne alone is said to have had 10,000 people gather in its Hoimark Square. For those of you not from Germany and who might not know exactly what happens here, I'll try and describe it. People dress up in the funniest and usually the most colorful clothing they can find. You'll see painted faces, confetti throwing, and flag waving. A parade usually happens midday where elaborate floats are driven down the street. Music is blasting and people are throwing treats and toys to all the watchers. There are sideshows and theater performances, there are bands playing and delicious foodstuffs to try. And don't forget about the alcoholic drinks being served. While this is no Oktoberfest, this November party has its own share of consumption. And how long does this party go on? Well, it lasts until Ash Wednesday in February. So don't worry if you miss the 11-11 opening. This party really starts heating up towards the end of January. And coming up right now is Destination Germany, where we take you on a journey somewhere in the country that we think is well worth a visit. 
whether you're a tourist or a permanent resident, a foreigner, or a German citizen. Here, we'll be covering the popular sites as well as those little-known corners of Deutschland. And all that really matters is showing you that Germany is an interesting and exciting place to visit. If you enjoy the destinations that we talk about each week, make sure you go to our website, thisweekingermany.de, and we'll have photos of each week's destination. And last week, we had a destination that actually took us inside Germany. And by in, I mean it took us under the ground and inside the magical caves of die Feengrotten. These caves began as a mining project stretching back hundreds of years, but now it's a beautiful tourist and health destination in Thuringia. Visitors can walk through the enchanted woods and then go deep under the earth to see what the Guinness Book of World Records says is the most colourful cave in the world. The air is said to be pure and full of healing properties, and fairies and other mythical creatures are said to have been seen from time to time. And Rob, I think we can tell just from that destination, Germany really is a land of surprises. You can find, well, just so many interesting and unique destination spots that aren't too far away from each other. So you could really kind of plan a cool tour that goes throughout the whole country. Yeah, well, I do have something else uh, pretty unique lined up for us today. Do you know who, let's see if I can say his name right, Frieden, Friedensreich Hundertwasser is? Yeah, I've heard of him. He's like this kind of artist who's known for kind of very challenging works, like architecture as well, right? That is him. Uh, he's not German. He's Austrian. But he has spent a lot of time in Germany, and he has done a lot of his artwork here as well. Yeah, and he designed quite a few buildings in Germany. So are you going to tell us about the, the buildings in general, or are you going to focus on one in, in specific? One building specifically. And it's I've actually been to this building twice before. Oh, cool. So, which one is it? This week's destination is the Grüne Citadella von Magdeburg, or in English, it's the Green Citadel located in Magdeburg. So, um, yeah, because it's not far from where you live, so I guess that's um, a very good reason to go and visit it. Yeah, this destination is in my uh, home state of uh, in Germany. It's in Saxony-Anhalt, and Magdeburg is the capital of Saxony-Anhalt, no less. And from here where I am, it's just over an hour, so I've gotten to go there a couple times. And uh, something I really like about the city, a little bit uh, off topic, is it has a lot of nice playgrounds. Because you <laughs> like hanging around in playgrounds? <laughs> because I have kids, and the kids uh, like playgrounds. Okay, okay, fine, okay, yes. fine. I like the playgrounds, too. Some of them are fun to go on as adults. <laughs> it does sound a little bit creepy, though. So, uh, tell us about this uh, citadel. It does sound pretty fancy. The Green Citadel. Yeah, First, the Green Citadel is not really green at all. I mean, it has green in it, but it is extremely pink. Like, you could not miss it if you're just walking by. You'll you'll just see this huge pink building that's just kind of like around all these kind of neutral gray and brown color buildings. Uh, so, uh, why is it called the Green Citadel if it's pink? I was just about to ask <laughs> that. Well, Hundertwasser uh, had a theme that he wants to bring nature and mankind together. So in the courtyards, on, on the kind of edges of the buildings, and uh, the entire roof covering, that's kind of ramp-like. So it's not just the, the very top, but uh, it, the, the roof is uh, from kind of different shapes. And all over the roof is all filled with flower gardens, and there's trees all over this building, like full-grown trees. So it's kind of a nature, environmental kind of project. It is and it isn't. It's more for the artistic architectural project, uh, but it just happens to incorporate nature as he believed that it's really important for humans and nature to connect in their living space. He said that humans have three skins. They have their natural skin, they have their clothing that they wear, and then they have their homes. And all his work was considered kind of like a, a protest against the geomization or the like the the just normal building block buildings. And so he went, all his buildings are extremely unique and, uh, and different than just the, the normal kind of like square buildings that you see everywhere else in the world. Oh yeah. The geometrization. <laughs> yeah, sure. Definitely. I mean, that's, wait, what does that mean? Geomet <laughs> geometrization? Okay. <laughs> okay. When you see the green cit uh, citadel, then uh, you'll notice that it has like all these curves around it and it's strange angles all over the place. And it doesn't really look like a, a normal building at all, and it's definitely not like the the cube type of buildings. And he didn't want people to have to live and work in uh, their just boring old uh, boring old buildings. So he wanted to create something new. So is it a, a kind of is it a residential building? What what kind of what's its use? It's kind of a little bit of everything. 
They do have a hotel in it where you can stay as a guest. So if you're visiting in Magdeburg and you, if you're in Magdeburg, you should definitely go see it. And if you want to, you can even stay in it. And my parents-in-law have actually stayed in it. And they said they had an amazing experience. And the inside of the hotel rooms were super colorful. And all the rooms were unique. So if you stay in one, then it's going to be different from another. And they got to stroll in the uh, the gardens that were stories above the ground. So you can kind of like be in a park but see the city go on at the same time. And it has... A little bit of uh, everything else as well. The bottom floors have little boutique shops and they have cafes and there's a, a kindergarten that's located there for some really lucky kids. They have doctor's offices and business offices and they even have a theater that can hold 250 people uh, with a, a lot of local plays and uh, meetings and it can be uh, rented out for uh, gatherings as well. And they they do have some private apartments there and I just think it would be extremely cool to be able to live in a place like this year round. Yeah, but you'd have to live in Magdeburg. That could be a problem. The rest of Magdeburg <laughs> is not quite as cool as uh, is the Hundertwasser House, the, the Hundertwasser's Green Citadel. Um, so, yeah, what did you do when you went there personally? I mean, did 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 you stay in the hotel? What was what was your the purpose of your visit? I can say that uh, every time that I have seen the uh, Green Citadel is every time that I have been to Magdeburg, which is only twice. I've only been there twice, and both times it was not specifically to go to the Hundertwasser's uh, building, the Green Citadel. But uh, every time that I have gone to Magdeburg just to, to visit friends, then I said, we have to go here. We have to take a look at it. And uh, we've gone to one of the little cafes that they had. And uh, it was it was really a lot of fun. It's really easy to get to, too. It's pretty much like right in the, the middle of the city and from the train station. It's maybe like a five-minute walk or so. So you can get there pretty easily. And uh, when I've been there, just kind of like wandering around the courtyards, uh, it ha- you can just see a super unique architecture. It's like nothing that you have ever seen before in a building. It looks so complex, and I have no idea how someone could have built an entire building like this. It's it's pretty amazing. I feel like this is like uh, what would be if you were a child and you told a child to build a ca- uh, to draw a castle, then this might be one of their their dream castles. <laughs> Wow, that certainly sounds pretty cool. And this is one of those destinations where seeing really is believing. So we invite you all to go to our website thisweekingerman.de to check out some photos of Frieden, Friedensreich Hundertwasser's Green Citadel of Magdeburg. And you can be blown away by its magnificence. Very few other places, both in Germany and, and, and around the world, hold such imaginative architecture. Next up, our German of the Week section, where we put the spotlight on a prominent person from this week's news who could be a German citizen or even a foreigner who we deem an honorary German, who's had an effect, for better or worse, on German culture, society or politics. For our German of the Week this episode, we'll be talking about the life of one of the country's great leaders, Helmut Schmidt. He was the Chancellor of West Germany from 1974 until 1982 and just passed away this week at the respectable old age of 96. Schmidt was the leader of West Germany during a particularly difficult time. It was the height of the Cold War, and he played one of the key roles in bringing together both economic reform to Germany that was still suffering from post-war fallout, as well as helping international cooperation between countries that were not very comfortable with each other at the time. So now, let's tell you a little bit more about this man and what he has accomplished in his life, for himself, his country, and the world. He was born in 1918 and was just the right age for being part of the Hitler Youth, and he rose to be a leader during the Second World War. That is, until his anti Nazi views got him demoted and then sent on leave. Later, he was drafted into the real German military and fought for his country, though, secretly, part of his heritage was Jewish. After the war, Schmidt started focusing on politics. In 1946, he joined the SPD party and was elected to the Bundestag in 1953. And just a few years later, he became a parliamentary party executive. He was then elected as the Senator of the Interior in Hamburg during the early 60s. But during the mid-60s, he came back to the Bundestag. In 1968, he became the deputy chairman of the SPD, and just a year later became the country's defense minister, where he made contributions to the new German military, including opening up army universities. In 1972, he continued moving up the ladder of German politics, 
to the position of Minister for Economics and Finance, where he really started helping Germany battle its rising inflation problem. And then, in 1974, Schmidt moved to the highest position, the Chancellorship of West Germany. This came about because of a spy scandal that involved the previous Chancellor, really Brent. When Brent was forced to resign, Schmidt became the Chancellor. But then he was officially elected in 1976 to retain the position of the West German Chancellor. He started out being tough and a disciplined leader by cutting public spending to help their economic hardships. The people thought he was a good leader and re-elected him again in 1980 to the position of West German Chancellor. Here, he is remembered for his role in the conflict between Russia and many of the countries from the West. He submitted proposals that were accepted by NATO to deploy medium-range nuclear missiles in Western Europe in case they were needed against the Soviets' military escalation. Many people in Germany were not happy with this plan and demonstrated with almost a half million people in 1981 against nuclear weapons. During the later political years, Schmidt had some major disagreements, both from members within his SPD party and their coalition that they formed with the FDPB. This was mostly about economic policies, as the country was struggling with money. The coalition broke apart in 1982, and a vote of no confidence was approved by the parliament, and Schmidt stepped down for the new West German Chancellor, Helmut Kohl. And here were some of the things Schmidt was known for other than his political career. One was his smoking habit. He was a long-time heavy smoker and obtained an almost cult status at his refusal to refrain from smoking within public buildings and during TV interviews. He was also known for an extramarital affair scandal, though he remained married to his wife until her death in 2010. And then, in a rare television interview in 2014, he admitted that he had fallen in love again, with his longtime secretary no less. Schmidt lived a long and complex life, his health really started failing this year in September, and he went to the hospital for a very serious condition of a blood clot in his leg. At this time, he finally decided to give up smoking after more than 80 years. But just a week ago, he was again in the hospital, and the doctor said that his health was quickly deteriorating. They decided to even encourage him to start smoking again. It's just a few more cigarettes were not something that he would worry about now. On Tuesday, November 20th, Helmut Schmidt passed away peacefully, surrounded by his family. He will be remembered as a great part of German history and a strong leader when the country was facing difficult times. And our profile of former Chancellor Helmut Schmidt brings us to the end of episode number 98. Okay, everybody, don't forget it is nearly time for the This Week in Germany live show. So head over to thisweekingermany.de slash live to get all the details. It will be taking place on Saturday, the 28th of November. So if you're in Berlin, come along and be a part of our audience. It is to celebrate our 100th episode. Also, you can go to our website, thisweekingermany.de, and you can find links to our entire archive of episodes, as well as our social media links and ways to support us. Big thanks to freelance journalists Helena Humphrey and Janelle Dumas-Laon for joining us on the program. We couldn't have covered our top story in such such depth without them. This Week in Germany is produced by Daniel Winter and is written and presented by myself and Rob Bishop. Thank you very much for listening. We'll be back in just seven days with more This Week in Germany. <laughs> <laughs>